So I'd love for you to take us back to the time when you were booking a private jet for Casey Neistat and there's Floyd Mayweather and there's Conor McGregor and they're about to fight and you're charged with the task of booking that flight. What was that like? So you're starting off with a bang. I appreciate that. Um, Gives me a little bit of PTSD thinking about it. So in the creator world, obviously Casey Neistat is the great white Buffalo. And he was a guy that I emailed no less than 30 times, never got a response. I DM'd him. I thought for a second, maybe I should just show up at his office and see what happened. I thought that'd be kind of weird. So I didn't do it. And then there was this massive fight, Mayweather McGregor, and he wants to go to the fight. A bunch of YouTubers want to go to the fight. And I was actually on a vacation. So it was this moment where I had to stop what I was doing and try to figure out how I was going to make this happen. And what's tough about ticket deals when you're working with creators is I'm fronting the money. So in my head at this point, it was somewhere between 50 and 75 K were the price of the tickets they want. So I'm out that money, right? So I'm coordinating these influencers. I'm coordinating this private jet. You could add that money together. And these are all before I've seen any creative. So going into the deal, you're already talking about 75 to 100 K of money that I've paid out and I've seen nothing. And in these scenarios, leverage is the most important thing to make sure you get the creative you want. So in that situation, I didn't have any leverage. I've already paid the creators. I've given them what they want and I have to now make sure the creative works. So that requires a lot of trust. And so I trusted Casey, I trusted everyone going and I just had to like, but you're still sweating it. And so I get on the seats, we get on the tickets and they get to Vegas. And the problem was they didn't realize what time the actual fight was, which is just insane considering how much money is on the line. They wanted to go to this fight. And so it's like 15, 20 minutes before the fight starts. And you should watch Casey's vlog because Casey is like, oh shit, we need the tickets. And so I'm calling my guys on site who bought these tickers, tickets off McGregor's team and trying to have him coordinate with Casey, like run him down the tickets, give him the tickets, they get to the venue. Thank God it fucking worked. I don't know if I'm a lot of cuss, but thank God it worked. And it was just this moment of, with influencers, you're taking a gamble no matter what, where you have to trust another creator and they're talking on behalf of your brand. brand. But when you're giving all that money up front, you really don't have leverage in the situation. But on the other side, you get like one of the most authentic videos you could possibly get. It's a true, it's the best commercial ever for SeatGeek, which, and we're a ticketing company, is someone going through that live event experience, barely getting in in time and having, you know, a, a memory for a lifetime. And that's the best possible commercial. So it was one of those ones where I didn't really tell my boss what was going on. I didn't really, I couldn't really let anyone know because if I let them know, they'd be like, what the hell are you doing? And so that was kind of always the rub with working with creators is, is that trust. What gave you the level of confidence to give all those and check all those boxes without ever running it by anyone? So it wasn't completely like I hadn't run it by any, but one, I think what there's two ways to look at it. One, I'm betting that the creator is not going to screw me over. Cause if you've, if you know SeatGeek and you see us in the influencer space, our whole goal is to work with creators long-term. We want a deep relationship with them. So that's always like dangling out there. The second thing is people hear cars, private jets, tickets, they sound crazy expensive and don't get me wrong. They are, but I w I can't say on this podcast, how much a Casey Neistat vlog costs, but you're talking six figures. You're talking well into the six figures. We didn't just get a Casey Neistat vlog. We got a vlog from like five, six other people where you're talking, you know, 10 million plus 15 million plus views that I'm actually getting cheaper because I'm giving them an experience. And so that's where you're exchanging the leverage. And this is, equation where I'm prepaying because I'm giving you tickets, I'm giving you the private jet, but I'm actually getting a cheaper rate than anyone else in the market can get because they need these things. Plus, those things are so easy to promote. They're so natural. It's not like I'm saying Slim Jims sent Casey Neistat to the fight. 
I don't know if I could make Slim Jims make that work. It would come off like a complete ad. So I have this kind of unfair advantage where our product is something that people really want, but yes, it's a lot of money, but at the end of the day, we're also getting a much cheaper rate than everyone else because it's so authentic. Yeah, and you mentioned that sometimes you don't, you, so you have SeatGeek, right? And SeatGeek is a ticket platform. But what happens when a creator comes in and says, I want to do some sort of vlog or advertisement for you that doesn't have to do with tickets? I want to tickets. buy someone a car. I want Correct. any of that kind of stuff. So that was a tough one to deal with me at first because if you know SeatGeek, we've bought uh, it's somewhere between 15 and 20 cars. Like I have a tweet that I like, I keep on updating in my notes app where it's like how many blue cars and I kind of made it cool. And then at a certain point it was hard to keep track. And this is one of those things where I think if you brought this to a marketing class anywhere, they tell you, this is a dumb idea. This isn't your product. This doesn't make sense. You're not a car company. You're, you're distancing yourself from what's actually important here, which is your product. And my hot take is I think, and I learned it, is that's a misconception I think with the influencer world. So when you work with creators and influencer marketing, the reason this works is because, so you have a relationship with your audience. SeatGeek doesn't have a relationship with Danny's audience. We're not there yet, maybe one day we will be, but when you do influencer marketing, you're tapping into that relationship and the best way, the best influencer marketing taps in and plays into what a creator wants to do. It becomes part of that channel and it up levels their content. And what brands make the mistake is say, okay, it's not about tickets, we don't wanna do it. And the problem is, is the audience is actually smarter than they think. They see that ad and they say, holy shit, SeatGeek is so cool, they made this amazing surprise happen. They helped pay you know, a college kid's tuition. They helped an aspiring vlogger get a laptop. Like we do stuff like that and that is ultimately what's memorable and you can tell it in the ad that it doesn't feel like an ad. So ultimately what you're trying to do is tap into that connection and keep that authenticity as close as possible because influencer marketing like pound for pound is or view by view is more expensive than if you were to go out and do Facebook ads or you were to go out and do Instagram ads or you're gonna go out and do YouTube ads. What you're paying up for is that relationship and the minute you start to make that relationship super transactional and super, I don't know, boxy, rigid, you lose the power of what you're buying in the first place. And that's the biggest mistake a lot of brands make. And we made that mistake for a long time. Um, and the creators ultimately pushed us to a place where we realized it wasn't a good idea anymore. And so that's kind of why we'll do cars. We'll just do anything where we can make a moment happen and, and you know make that content better as a place SeatGeek wants to be. You know, you we're talking right now, like influencer marketing is so obvious and giving these creators money is so obvious, but I'm pretty sure you came up in a time when it wasn't obvious and it wasn't the correct thing to do. And I, I believe you had to convince people that this was the right path to go down. When you look back, how did you go about figuring out that this was the leverage point, giving money to creators? So... I wish I could give myself a lot of credit for this, but I don't know if I can. What I saw was at a startup, you're always trying to be on the next thing. So for us, we were one of the first movers on SEO, which sounds every company has SEO now. We were the first movers on to Facebook ads. And then we were the first movers, and this is where it really came to my world, we were the first movers onto podcasts. And podcasts six, seven years ago, no one knew what it cost. We sponsored the first Bill Simmons podcast ever and ESPN didn't even know how to price it. We were like, we want to buy this. And they're like, what do you mean? And we're like, we'll give you $200 for an ad read. If you think about it or, or whatever it was, that's absolutely crazy that Bill Simmons, one of the biggest names in sports is talking about SeatGeek, but it was a mispriced asset for a while. It was something that people didn't understand. And in a world where you see 10,000 ads a day, you have to ask yourself like what actually breaks through the clutter because listen sponsorship is valuable don't get me wrong but if you're watching an nba basketball game with your friends ask them to close your their eyes and say what brands are on the court it's hard ask somebody what their favorite you know out of home ad is or what ad they saw on the internet it's really really hard to break through to people 
And the way to do it is to actually integrate into the actual content. So podcast was the first. What people didn't get quite at my company, but they definitely get it now was YouTube would be a thing. And so I remember sitting in the office one day and there's this developer, shout out V, who was, he would code for, he was such a good coder, he'd code for like half or three quarters of the day and then he watched FIFA gamers on YouTube. And I was looking for something to do and I was like, that's weird. He's like, you should sponsor these guys. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then it like stuck in my brain that like maybe there's something there. The problem is, is FIFA gamers are very international. So they have a very international audience. We only sell it at the time in the US. So that took me to NBA 2K gamers. And um, we kind of went down this rabbit hole of just like emailing these gamers who at the time were 16, 15 years old and their moms were sending me their W9s and they didn't even know what a W9 was when I first asked them. It's like, okay, how about I send you to a Clippers game? And that moment, it was, it just like clicked. You could tell there was traction. They had an audience that was there. And if you take a step back at the time and still now YouTubers are doing, these YouTubers were doing 200,000 views on their, on their YouTube videos. That anyone i'm a very i'm an aspiring podcaster if i could get 200,000 people to listen to my podcast i would be on over the moon that is a massive audience but for some reason when it came to youtube people didn't see that they didn't see that 200 views the same way they saw podcasts the same way they saw tv now you have mr beast doing 50 million views of video 50 million views of video that's a top three cable show but no one thinks about it that way and they still don't and so i think what it was was changing our mindset to realize this community is real and it's strong and it's a place where, coming back to my original point, the competitors aren't gonna follow. Not many people wanna deal with, we just talked about Casey Neistat. That was so stressful. I remember just like stressing out, I'm freaking out, I have $100,000 on the line, I haven't told my boss, I'm dealing with Casey Neistat texting me, I'm dealing with people from Vlog Squad texting me, people are just like on my ass. And not many marketing people want to do that bluntly. They want to hire an agency and have them do it for them. They don't want to deal with like trying. I was calling an Uber in Vegas for these guys. It was very to figure out where they were. I'm dropping this pin, then I'm talking <laughs> to my seek. It was just it was a craziness. But not many people want to do that. And I think that's um. There's two things I'm trying to say. What was my long winded response? One, people didn't know the value of this asset. They saw this thing and said, "Oh, it's just a bunch of kids playing video games." And didn't believe there was real community there. Two. We get hits hit with ads more than ever. And I don't think marketers and people ask themselves what ads do they actually remember? And three, a lot of brands just don't want to deal with that shit. StubHub and Ticketmaster, they don't want to deal with that shit. They're going to do TV. They're going to do other stuff. And that's our competitive advantage is like we are going to do that. And we firmly believe this is where media is going. Yeah, going back to reaching out to the 2K players back in the day versus today, what does a typical pitch look like from your end to that person? How has the pitch changed over time as well? Well, at first, no one responded because you're not if you're not a brand that people know, especially in the influencer space, they get hit with so many pitches every day. It's very hard to get recognized. It's very hard for to get, just get that response. So it took us about a, me a month and a half to get someone to respond to me. So that was the first issue. And it was, I didn't really know what I was doing. It was like, Hey, we want to work with you. How much would it cost for a, a, a 45 second integration? So in their video, they do an ad. And at one point, I think they quoted us. It was like, let's say $5,000. And for us at the time, $5,000 was a pretty meaningful spend. And so I was like, okay, what about, what if I put you row four at the Clippers game? Row four at the Clippers game cost me $400. And the kids are just like, fuck yeah, I'll do that. The reason being, I'm solving a content problem for them. So sure, the price is a lot cheaper. Maybe they knew that, maybe they didn't. But if you're a YouTuber, and you make content every day you're trying to find new content and if someone can solve that problem for you to say if i can solve your thumbnail and title and it's row three at a clippers game i'm bringing value to you so then they're going to say all right i'll do that it's really easy to do a pitch after that about this ticket app that got me here so that's how it started i'd say the space has evolved a ton those same guys now are just uh, jesser christopher london they just signed a hundred thieves. They're making millions of dollars a year. We built a basketball court in their backyard. They have 
agents, everything. So the space has changed a lot. And now if you were to pitch, it's not quite that easy. You know, Jesse's mom is not sending me W9s now. I deal with agents, I deal with managers and that stuff. So the space has definitely changed and gotten a lot more sophisticated. But if you're trying to get in at first, it's very hard to get recognized, kind of like what you do. But once you get that first ad, you can say, okay, look at this. This is, we've actually done something with someone. Now we've been co-signed by Jesse. It's easier to find other creators to work with. Yeah, it sounds like you, once you're in it, then you can play around with the space and play around with additional opportunities, which is makes sense. It's like a, a, a little ecosystem in that way. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious because you've seen the rise of so many different creators because you've been in the space for so long. What are some of the commonalities that you see in creators that don't lose themselves in the process of what they're making? Hmm. That's a good question. Cause we've seen a couple creators kind of go through this rise and then at a certain point they just, it, it becomes too much and there's so much pressure. Uh, Cody Co is an example to me of someone who I just like respect a ton. He's a former software developer, sold an app when he was at Duke, turned software developer, then becomes a Viner, then becomes a YouTuber. And he approaches it, it's just like, you could tell he does not have the, he's an extremely hard worker and he spends his time making these videos the best possible, but he does not put this ever increasing pressure on himself to constantly one up the next thing. He's diversifies his revenue. So he's a YouTuber, he has a podcast, he has a Patreon, he does live shows, um, he does cameos. Like you're, the top creators are very, very diversified. They understand kind of that the YouTube algorithm is going to push up and down their content and they try to get not too emotionally invested. But I don't know. And they also just work their ass off. Like you, if you hang around Casey, you hang around a top YouTuber, like anyone who thinks that these guys and girls don't work hard is wrong. I think they work. It's crazy how hard they work. Because if you think about it, someone like, I don't know, Mr. Beast is producing a show that's a top five show on TV all the time. Like the amount of pressure and work that you put into it. And if you're a vlogger, every day you're trying to make your life interesting, make it cool, make it interesting to people. And that's a ton of pressure. And you're broadcasting that to, you know, 300, 500,000 people. And I was talking to Alicia Marie, she's a top female vlogger. She was doing YouTube before you could do thumbnails. And she was just like, it, it's a constant pressure to make that content and churn it out. And that puts a really heavy emotional toll. And so trying to avoid that burnout too. You've seen behind the scenes of all these creators, and yet you've decided I'm going to become a creator myself in the sense of a podcast and starting a YouTube channel. What went into that decision? Um, two things. I mean, ego wise for two years, I've just been like, why don't I do a podcast? I know these creators. I talk to them. I feel like I really want to get into this world. I started doing Twitter recently, like two years ago, and I, and I really was enjoying it. I was building an audience there and I thought, why don't I take the next step and move from Twitter to a podcast? The second thing I think, and it's really happening now, but people didn't really think about these creators as entrepreneurs. For a while, these creators were like, in a lot of people's minds, just these kids who get Lamborghinis and they live this fake lifestyle. Maybe they take a couple pictures and you talk to them and it's very clear how business minded the space is. And I think in the last six months, the word creator economy has become a buzzword to the point where you almost don't know what it means anymore, but that is just, it shows how much these creators are now getting recognized for the entrepreneurs they are. I mean, take Mr. Beast, he has a venture fund. He launched, I think, I think they raised like, I don't know, 10, $20 million. They have Mr. Beast burgers. He just launched like a, a fund to fund other creators. Like the space is, he has finger on the app too, which is an app that hit number one on the app store. Like the space is professionalizing so fast. And because these creators own so much distribution, so Mr. Beast or large creators can distribute whatever they want to millions of people. They are just like the, the, the new entrepreneurs. And I felt like people didn't really think of them that way. Is it too late to get involved in the creator economy? No, I, I think like 
No, I think what you're seeing right now is the shift I'm seeing is how powerful niches are. So like, for instance, I know if you're a financial, if you like talk about finances or in the financial world, maybe you get 100, 200,000 views a video. Do you want to know who is paying a lot of money for those people right now? Robin Hood, Webull, and Public. And like, that's a very, a very captive audience. And you don't have to have the biggest views in the world. But if you own a niche, and it could be a weird ass niche, people are realizing now just how powerful that is. Um, so no, it's not too late. I also think, like for me, do I think I'll be a creator full time? No. Do I think there's a role for this to play to help me hopefully talk to other creators, hopefully get into other startup investments. Like there's different ways to leverage the creator community. That doesn't mean that you're a creator full time. It's kind of an extension of your work. So no, it's definitely not too late. And there's just so much tech being built for it right now. That makes it really interesting. What's been the biggest unexpected benefit of starting your podcast and putting yourself out there on Twitter? Unexpected benefit. It's a good question. One, people even agreeing to do it. Like, I mean, dude, I, I was, we were talking before this podcast. I don't know how this guy does three episodes a week and just like listening to your own voice and just how much you learn from hearing yourself talk and getting in and out of questions. It just, you, you learn so much about yourself in this process and you gain, you go from insecurity to I'm the God to like, I'm an idiot. It just, it's a very self, makes you very, very, I don't know, think about yourself differently. In terms of the podcast itself, I mean, like I had Cody on, Cody Cole on one of my episodes, and then, you know, we were, now Cody and I are able to, we did an investment together in Lolly, which is, you know, the Bitcoin um, browser plugin. And like what the podcast hopefully lets people see is I work directly with these creators they're entrepreneurs and I think going forward, if you're a startup and raising money, I can help you work with these creators, whether it's Casey, Cody, you name it. I can help navigate that world and the, and the podcast is an extension of that. And I think shows that I have these connections, but also who these people are and the promotion we can give them. So I don't have like a great succinct answer, but like to me, it just is like, I feel like I've grown a lot doing it, but it's hard yeah. as hell. <laughs> it's a process for sure. I want to switch gears here and talk about your relationship with Pat McAfee because you did something really cool recently where in the middle of a NFL draft live stream, I'll, I'll let you tell the story. But first, I, I want to get to August 1st, 2017. You're standing next to Pat McAfee. It's a picture. We'll put it up for those watching on video of you guys playing soccer, I believe. Yeah. What is the story behind that? Oh shit. That goes way back. So like, I don't it, it's not, let me first like paint the picture on Pat McAfee because I've honestly never met a human like Pat McAfee. I don't think I ever will. I mean, I'm gonna do it as succinctly as I can, but this is a guy who grew up in Pittsburgh, decided he was gonna become a kicker, then but didn't have the money to go to kicking camp. So he gambled. He went to a underground poker game, bet it all on the game because his parents wouldn't pay for the camp. He had never really kicked in, in high school before. Goes to the kicking camp. It's in Miami. Kicks. Beats every other kicker there. The top kickers in the country. Wins a scholarship to West Virginia. Kicks for West Virginia. Becomes one of the best college kickers at West Virginia. Absolutely kills it. Then he gets drafted to the Colts. They say, we don't want you to kick field goals anymore. You want you to punt. He becomes the best punter in the decade for um, rated by pro football focus. And then he's, but he's an iconic legend. So while he's there, then he sells himself as a stand-up comedian and is selling out these venues. So this is a kicker who is actually a stand-up comedian. And in the midst of like a multi-million dollar deal, he quits that to join Barstool. So this is just like, to paint the picture, it's a very, very legendary human being. I've never met anyone like it. And for our primary partners, and this is getting a little in the weeds, but not really, we ticket a lot of the MLS teams and a lot of the Cowboys. And what we found, one of the greatest ways to let the world know about our partnerships is to partner with creators. So we've done 
the basketball guys I mentioned earlier, we did a collab with them in Lonzo Ball down for the Pelicans. We had three top training videos, top 10 training videos on YouTube that we did for them. It's just a way to bring new eyeballs, particularly to these partners we have. With Pat McAfee, he was in a kicking contest against, um, he was kicking against Tim Howard. And I remember being like, this is gonna be a shit show. And Pat came in and he just like killed it. I mean, he has a rocket leg. Um, and it was a great video. And I just remember just being like, Pat would go up to every single person in the venue and like talk to them. And I just had never met somebody who had that kind of presence. And since then we always stayed in touch. Um, we were his first sponsor on his, on his channel. And, uh, I don't know if I'm talk I'm digressing too much, but I'll say it. It was funny. We had a first episode and he didn't know how podcast ads work. So we sponsored the first episode. Second episode, he looks at his his ad sheet and SeatGeek wasn't there. So he records a 30 minute episode where he just shits on SeatGeek. He didn't understand that our cadence, what we were sponsoring were every other episode. So I was like, dude, you can't so the episode actually never came out. They claim it's still in the archives, but it was um it was like in that moment, I don't know, we just we just kind of became friends and since then built that up. When he left Barstool, we became the presenting sponsor of the Pat McAfee show. And he's one of those people where in this industry, I've always found relationships like really matter. And it sounds cliche, but if you have that personal connection to the talent, so whether it's Casey Neistat or it's, you know, or it's Pat McAfee, like any of these YouTubers, I try to have them in their phone. I keep those connections live because in that moment he left Barstool, he's starting his own company. We can go and say, we're gonna be the presenting sponsor. We're sponsoring you for a year. And if you're a startup, which he was at the time, that's your runway. That makes you say, okay, I have employees. I know what I'm gonna do. And we were willing to take that bet on him and he's paid it back like tenfold. And so we've always worked together. And now he's at the point where He's one of the top sp sports personalities, I would say, definitely in the U.S. and definitely in the NFL. And his YouTube show is doing, you know, 70,000 views an episode. He's having Aaron Rodgers on. If you think about, I don't know if ESPN in the middle of the day is getting 70, you know, engaged audience. I'm not talking about yourself at the gym watching first take on mute. I'm talking about going, going onto YouTube and finding this. That's hard to do. So... I'm building to this point, I promise I'll get there. NFL draft happens um, and we've been ready to sponsor Pat. We actually sponsored the show yesterday. So we're timing everything for NFL schedule release, it makes a ton of sense. NFL schedule release, buy your tickets on SeatGeek, use promo code McAfee, bang. Um, I'm sitting there on the couch and we're watching this view count. I remember I see 120 or 100K and I was like, that's not right. Like YouTube has a glitch. There's no way he has a hundred. It's not like A-Rod's on. Like, listen, he can do numbers. And this isn't me discounting Pat, but I didn't think they'd do a hundred K really before the even draft started. And I we had such a close connection that I was just like, shit, we should do something. So I called up my partner, Greg, and we're sitting there and we texted. We literally texted in the ad. So if you're watching the episode, you, you can check it out on my Twitter, self-promotion. But there's this moment where Pat literally is reading his phone and reading the ad for the first time live to his audience in front of 130 people. And then he says, use the hashtag SeatGeeks back. And the hashtag ended up trending. We had like thousands and thousands of people participate because you had a chance to win season tickets. But to me, it was like so succinctly what creators and what new media is, where it's not like if, let's say ESPN, it's not like I could text into an ESPN show get an ad on the spot and he delivered it so authentically and the audience loved it, loved it. And so it's just like, it's it's something you don't see anymore or not, not you don't see anymore. It's just a exact example of like where new media is going and it's our job to constantly take advantage of those moments. And if there was middlemen, if I hadn't built that connection with Pat and Pat hadn't, I mean, I was at Pat's wedding. Like if I didn't have that connection, I never would have been able to, to make that ad happen. How could, old media beat that right you're literally here and, and you're texting somebody and they're and the audience is getting the authenticity of the moment it's impossible to beat isn't just that inevitable five ten twenty years down the line how things will get opened up more and people will see the creator and behind the scenes of how the ad is happening 
more and more. Yeah, that's the funny part. I think people think that people don't want to see ads happen. And some of the best promotions we've done is when the creator just fully is like, all right, I'm going to call you in or I'm going to do this thing. And because the audience is now along for the ride with you. And it's this moment for Pat, him reading that text there was validation to the 130 people because they felt like they were in an audience. They were part of a moment that was unique and they were validated in that moment. The fact that we were calling in this ad, it's like, oh shit, I'm part of this moment with Pat. He just got a deal and now I have a chance to win season tickets because I was here. And like that's what people kind of don't get about ads is you don't have to hide ads. If you make them, if you have that relationship, you can actually make them a value ad, which is a crazy thing to say, but we had all these news articles about the ad. It's a fucking ad. It's not, we're celebrating an ad. And if you get to that point, that's really, really powerful. In terms of new media, yeah, I don't know how they compete. I think what I'm more scared of for them is, I'm not scared for them because I don't care that much, but if you're the top 1% of talent anymore, why do you need ESPN anymore? So if I'm Pat McAfee, if I'm you know, the best writer for the New York Times, I could go to Substack. If I'm the best sports personality, I could own my own distribution. Why should I not own my own distribution? Not every creator wants to do that, but the top 1% of creators will. So if you're, if you're rising up the ESPN ranks and you're a top, top talent, at some point you have the decision to make, do I want to stay with the mothership or do I want to do my own thing? And it's never been easier to do your own thing. So I think what the question I haven't answered I haven't figured out is how does old media play in a world where the top 1% of talent, it's not in their interest to stay anymore. And so then you're just going to get this watered down product. So what do you do? So that's kind of, that's where I really think talent wise, they're in a really, really tough position. It's a changing, changing landscape. And when you say that ads can be a, a value ad, I'll never forget when Tim Ferriss went to a community only no ad model and people are like no put the ads back because we want to know what you're yeah. you're vetting and we trust you and so now he has like 10 minutes of ads in front of his episodes and some small percentage of people get upset by that but overall you're learning what tim ferris actually enjoys and actually wants to buy himself so when there's a trust level there's something really there that where ads can be valuable Totally. And then if you think about it, I rec you've recorded with Packy, I've recorded with Packy. That's a situation where the other side of the coin is if you're the top 1%, you own your distribution, you go paywall. The problem is if you go paywall is that's where old media still has a moment. Because for the most part, you, I can read ESPN, you can read ESPN. What I love about Packy is that he did his newsletter for free. And so I think there's going to be a gap for creators. Pat stuff is for free. And so I think that's really interesting to me is where ads can play a vital role. If you read Packy's ads, they're good and he does company profiles and he makes them, it's a sponsored post. He clearly says a sponsored post. It's a profile of a company that he is paid to do a profile for, but he puts a lot of vetting into that profile. He makes money and that allows him to keep his content for free. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Dan, Ben Thompson, we're in the weeds, but like that's someone who has paywalled his content. So his audience is limited to some extent. And so I think ads can be very free, and if you do them right, because it opens up your distribution in the in a way where you and I could read it kind of serendipitously and kind of have that moment where you get hooked on Packy. Like I had that moment, and that's if it was a Substack model where it was a paywall, I don't know if I would have. If you're building, it doesn't make sense to say this is the walled garden where only a select few can access it. It makes right. sense to expand and have serendipity occur. And Packy's done that so well. One thing I want to touch on with you is you've built relationships with so many different people and you've been forced to make connections quickly. What are the ways you think about going about making a new connection with someone and forming that into a tight bond where you can go to someone's wedding eventually and, and make a real friendship with them? Yeah, it's tough because I would say I'm actually like a terrible networker at least in the old school sense. If you put me in one of those, like I remember once I was like sitting in one of those like networking rooms. I used to work for Wasserman. It was like a sports business networking forum and I hated it. I hate it. I hate doing that stuff. It's like not who I am. I'm like a pretty antisocial person. So for me with these relationships, it's not like 
I said, Pat, like, hey, would love to collab. Like, hey, let's talk. Hey, let's do this. If you're talking to someone, you always have to know what your value add that you're bringing them and what leverage and be real with it. Eric is a great example of a guy who, when he approaches working with creators and he's a creator who's just blown up in the past year because he knows the value prop. He says, okay, if I'm gonna partner with Logan Paul, I have to bring him value. For me, if I'm gonna partner with Pat, I gotta help make his shit possible. I gotta work with him. And sometimes that means like with creators, sometimes, and this is maybe a terrible thing to say, not terrible, but against marketing logic, I'll sponsor things that I know aren't gonna necessarily work because I know the broader partnership. So if a partner wants to do something, and let's say it's like a 100% of the deal, 20% of the deal I know is a passion project for them. This is something they wanna do. I'll do that 20 because I know the other 70 will probably pay. And it's gonna be a situation where I'm gonna get that call, I'm gonna get opportunities that other people aren't gonna get. And I'm gonna trust them on their ideas. So it's a little bit, to me, it's just like always leading with value and understanding realistically Someone's not just gonna to wanna to network with you for no reason. You gotta bring value to them. And so I just always try to do that. I'm always super, super concise. Um, and I, and I, I never screw them over. Like I'm not gonna pull out the rug from them. If I say something, I mean it and I'll do it, I'm gonna do it. So I don't know, I don't have a great networking formula other than like lead with value lead with value, be a good person. And it seems like you're always on, like you're always responding and you're, you're quick with the response. Is that accurate from the outside with a creator? Like you're, you're looking at the NFL stream and you're saying, Oh, I, I got to text Pat right away. And it seems like quickness is an element to your success. Is that correct? That's correct. But with the Pat stream, they texted us. That's the funny part. Gotcha. So like we had that relationship. It's more like there's this Bezos quote. Maybe I'm, I'm a sucker for quoting Bezos on a podcast, which makes me a sicko fan, but whatever. It's like this quote of once you have 60% or 70% of the information, it's too late. And I think mm -hmm. that's the, one of the biggest mistakes in, in business, but definitely marketing. If you can move quickly, so that pad opportunity, a lot of people would get that opportunity and they'd say, okay, 130 viewers. They would try to do some math. They need to get approvals from other their bosses. They need to do that. By the time that's happened, you've missed the moment. And so for us, I try to keep it in my head that like you're gonna have to act with not all the information and act quickly and decisively. Because in this moment, put yourself in the shoes of a creator. If So Cody Cohen and Noel, they wanna film a music video and they need money now to front the cost of the music video. I'm gonna take a risk there because if I ask them for a billion tons of information, I need to know exactly this, exactly this, I need to talk to the producers, I need to run it by my boss, it might be too late. And so you're gonna mess up sometimes and sponsor stuff that doesn't hit as much as you want it to. But at the same time, the if you look at like the world of brands, there's only like 5% of them, 2% of them that can work that fast. And if you're not gonna be the most money, and we're not gonna ever be the most money just because we don't have the most money, Chipotle or name another publicly traded blue chip brand will, we have to be the fastest and we have to be the easiest to work with. And so if you know that going into a deal, what your value prop to a creator is, quick, fast, decisive, and like not a whole lot of strings attached of like it has to be exactly about tickets, you can do some real damage. So yeah, that's what we try to keep a mindset of. But I'm, I'm, I'm decently always on, but I still go to sleep at 10 p.m. So I'm not like that crazy. <laughs> what gives your boss so much trust in you to get these deals done and, and to not have to go through everything? Um, I think my track record, like I don't, it's not like I, I, we, we put ourselves in a position of, it was funny. So for the Pat Reed, so my boss is new now. He, he joined about a year ago, but we hadn't really been doing ads in the last year. And so the next morning I slacked him and I was like, hey man, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to run this by you, but like this was a moment that I thought we could not miss. And he was like, why are you apologizing? And I was like, well, he's like, listen, you've earned the right. And also that's what makes you good. That's what you're best at. And so, yeah, I, I, I think it could be scary maybe to another boss that like I'm, I'm moving on this deal without his approvals, but at the same time, SeatGeek has seen the results of what we've done. And it is truly our competitive advantage is working with creators. We can't, we don't want to compete against Ticketmaster and StubHub on TV. That's not in our DNA. 
if you want to go into the creator world, it's messy. It's not easy. You got to move fast. And if you try to make it the super clean process, like it is doing a, a Facebook ad, you're just not going to work. So I don't know. They just trust that I'm going to make the right decisions. I'm a really hard negotiator and my results kind of speak for themselves. What makes for a good negotiation? Not negotiating for the sake of negotiating. I think like I, I say I'm a good negotiator. It's mostly like I know, I know what I want at the end of the day. And our value add usually in a negotiation is we are trying to work with creators long term. So if you're a creator, let's say, and every month you're trying to bring, figure out how, you're, how I'm going to make money. If I can offer you a 10, a 12, a year long deal, that solves so much of your anxiety. And so maybe let's say your spot rate, your co per video cost is, I mean, a lot of people are hundreds of thousands of dollars, but let's use it's $25,000. I don't know if I can afford that 25K rate, but if I say, all right, we'll do for 15K per video, but we'll sponsor you for six months. That's a value add. So it's trying to understand what they want and tailoring your offer to them. You want, they want it to be easy. They want it to be lightweight. So I wouldn't say I'm like a negotiator where like I'm good at like looking you in the eye and saying like, no, we won't do this, don't do this. But like, we just know what we want. We know what the, it's knowing what they want is almost more important. Yeah, it sounds like you're playing long-term games with people who also want to play long-term games. Right, but other brands don't. It's a, it's a, it's a really weird space where a lot of brands want to dip their toes in, do a little bit, do that. But to get to scale and creator marketing, you can't do it. It takes too long. You got to stack up long-term deals. Going into every month, we have 150 to 200 videos already booked. They're wow. already booked. They're done. We're just in month. We're just trying to add, you know, three or four new deals. But going, but you want the bulk of that done because you're just constantly spinning your wheel to try to find new people, and it's very hard to just have that conversation. Where if you can stack deals, that's where you can actually get to scale and influencer marketing. Why do you think other companies are just trying to dip their toes in and not creating these long-term games? Um, it's a good question. I think it's intimidating. Um, I think there's this perception that there's always better creators out there. And ultimately, like YouTube is a massive place, but it's also a small place at the same time, if, especially if you're playing at the top of the food chain. There's not that many creators and who are just talking like Mr. Beast level, Emma Chamberlain level. Like it's just, it's a small, small world. So I think they see the spot rate. They think, okay, it works. And then they wait, wait. So, so they do a deal and then it takes them six, 60 days to figure out if it works. By the time they want to rebook, dude, Cody Co's bucked out for the next six months. You're not getting in. You've already missed your opportunity. So it comes back to that same, you have to know 60% of the data, 50% of the data and make a decision. For us, we wanna make a decision less than seven days, usually three days. First deal happens, we look at the numbers, it's not exactly right, but we can see what kind of traction we're driving and we're back in your inbox three days later, ready to book that long-term deal. And I think other brands want more information. They wanna know what's happening. They wanna feel super confident in their decision. But by waiting there, not only is Cody Co booked out, but he's probably 20K more expensive. Like that's, that, that's how fast the space is moving. So it's ultimately to your dis, you have to move faster. And I think that's just not in a lot of companies' DNA. Yeah, and when you move fast, you sometimes make mistakes yep. or sometimes have results that you don't um, want, right? So yep. one example in particular, you said you've sponsored an influencer with 15 million followers that drove nine purchasers. Could you tell that story without obviously putting someone on blast uh, i will i won't say the name it's it's a rapper um so at the time i was feeling myself we had just done i don't know what we just did oh fuzzy tube sponsored fuzzy tube and this anybody knows youtube back in the day fuzzy tube and he's he's back now and he's doing really well but at the time he was the guy and i, I we did an ad with him and it literally crashed seeky and it was <laughs> On one hand, terrible, but for me, it was like, wait, why is Seeky crashing? And I got to be that guy in Slack being like, oh, it was my little promo. So I was feeling myself and it was NBA finals and 
this, I reached out to this rapper. I was like, I'll send you this event. It'll be great. And I could tell right away that the situation, I didn't feel the same level of maybe trust back that I knew exactly what I was getting. And, but I was in pretty deep in the negotiations and I decided to push through even though I knew the trust level wasn't there. And it was an Instagram uh, picture and the, the guy showed up. He showed up at after halftime for courtside to the NBA finals. I mean, come on. And I just remember watching the TV and there's this empty fucking seat. And I'm just like, and all my company knows that that is happening. So all people, my friends know, and they're like, yo, where is he? Where is he? And I'm just like, fuck, I have no idea. And I'm just so pissed. Um, and he does it. And the ad was like shitty. And it was just like, it was like in the caption. It just, it just didn't work. And yeah, it, it was, an, it was, it was, that was more, I blame on myself more than anyone else. There's some deals and then, yeah, that deal did nothing. I mean, it did like 15 purchasers. And it was, you know, the guy had, I don't know how many set he said 15 million. I don't remember when 15 million and nine purchases, what you said. Yeah, terrible. Um, and then we work with some creators who have like 20,000 followers and they'll do, you know, a hundred purchasers. So that's just, the game, the more the mistakes happen in a, in an issue of you're trying to buy a creator, maybe who's trying to time creators journeys don't always can you continue to go neatly up. And so sometimes in a long term deal, you can end up in a situation where it works for the first two months. And then by the back half, you start to go underwater on it. And that it sucks, but you chalk it up kind of with like the cost of doing business, but that'll happen. But that's also just the nature of creators career arcs is they don't always go up into the right but then those same people foozy tube is now back and better than ever and so his deals are going to come back to him so that's something that more happens because of long-term deals yeah so going back to the 15 million 15 million rapper yeah what gave you the level of distrust that it wasn't a good idea what gave you that gut feeling of like i don't like this um it's a good question four years ago so i'm trying to remember like what really stood out it was a situation where like i i sent we did the deal and then it was just constantly where are the tickets 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 and i was like okay but i haven't even sent you any of the copy and the deliverables where's that and i was like when is this going up what is it going to look like and i was not getting real good responses there and then at the same time and like usually people tweak it, do that. So I didn't get good responses there and all they wanted was the tickets. And I felt like I was just getting used and there wasn't a level of, okay, I know I have to do something for you. So I don't know, it just, it just didn't feel right. It felt very ego driven, um, but God, that sucked. Coming on <laughs> Monday and you're just like, oh yeah, that ad did terribly. And everyone at the company knows. And I was just riding off this high of crashing the site and then next thing you know you're out of low so that was like a reality check but also you know what was i thinking sponsoring in hindsight it was just my ego more than anything else and by the same token can you get a sense for this is going to be a good partnership this is this is really exciting because i know that this is going to work out well based on how that initial interactions are going with a creator sometimes sometimes um i think the the when you feel, when you look at their social blade chart and they're like, their their views are going like this and they're really excited. They come to you with a good idea. Sometimes like that's, you just know it's gonna do well. Um, to me, it's more watching their content and just feeling like they are building a community. When you're trying to find creators, you wanna find a community more than views. Cause views, well, the worst subscribers, the worst, analytic would be subscriber because it's just a, such a trailing metric and you don't know if they're just an OG YouTuber who's maybe fallen off. So that's the first mistake people make. The second mistake, views. So if I put out videos that said, you know, top 10 iPhone hacks, they might do really well SEO wise, but does anyone actually care what that creator has to say? Is he building a community? Is he or she building a community? And maybe he is, but a lot of those people aren't. And so that's the next level is trying to disseminate to determine who is building community and who's just here for really good SEO and really good clickbait titles. And you can kind of suss it out. There's no good metric, there's no good scientific metric, which I love, 
because I'm not like this big math guy. So there's not this, everyone wants to apply all these analytics to it. There's some of that, but it's how many comments are they getting? Are they making inside jokes on the video? Can you tell there's like a family they are building and there's a community that they are building? It, are there other socials popular? So if you follow Pat on YouTube, Pat's Instagram is popping, Pat's Twitter's popping. You know that wherever he goes, his audience is gonna follow him. Those are all signs that there's a real strong community here. And that's when I get really excited because I know I'm tapping into this relationship that is very, not many people have that, especially at scale. Because as you, as you create or scale, it's very hard to maintain that community level. And so that's when I get the most excited. So going into one of those deals where I feel like I'm really tapping in, the creator's pumped, I get excited. Now, you just don't want to get too excited because then if the numbers don't work out, you're just like, I don't get it. But it's like, it's kind of like venture. You go into a venture agreement, it's like, all right, I'm going to place 10 bets. And an influencer, you do the same thing. You place 10 bets, you hope three of those bets will probably pay off everything. One bet is going to go completely south. And you have to know that going in. And that is hard for a lot of marketers because Facebook, Google, all these ads are, it's very analytical. It's very, you know, not the opposite of that. It's like being a public market investor. And it's like they say, you never want to invest in the public markets because there's a billion people who are doing a lot more math. But in the private markets, it's kind of like what influencer is where you're taking 10 bets. Some of them really work out crazy good like Pat. And some of them are ones where you're just like, what was I doing? Of course, it didn't work. To, uh, to someone who's just starting out, maybe in their first year or two of creating, what would some advice you would give them to building a community? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, one, I have a disclaimer. I've never done it like to the same extent they have. So I would qu I think it's, it's easy for me to pontificate on it, harder to do. I'd say... One of the best people I've seen do it short term has been Eric because he has his audience. He has this quote that he said where he said, I want my audience to know if they poke this button, this happens, which I think he stole from Steve Jobs. And so in his videos, his audience can kind of determine the outcome of what he's going to do. So if they say do things, he will do them. They have a direct role. It's like a, one of those like, when you were growing up, those novels where it said, you pick this, go to page 20, you pick this, go to page 50. He is actively engaged with them. He's responding to the comments and that kind of level of community. I think he is a, a role model for someone doing it well. To me, I just love the inside joke world because if you have an inside joke, you're developing a friendship with someone on a level that is pretty next level. And then the third thing I've heard that really stuck out to me is treat your audience like a FaceTime call because I didn't think of it that way. And as an aspiring creator myself, you want to almost be like, hey, everyone, welcome to my show because you grew up with that, right? But people don't want that. They want that authentic FaceTime feel. Um, and so I think that's a great way to build community, FaceTime, feeling like your audience is really part of it, having them weigh into the content are all just different ways where that's something like, I don't know, I'm watching a TV show. It's not like I can jump into the comments and say, you know, what I want to have happen next. It's not like I can feel like if I push this button, this happens. So, yeah, on the FaceTime piece, I tell people all the time, like when you're recording a podcast, keep the flaws in, keep the mistakes in because people aren't in it for the perfect version of you. That's what we're used to seeing growing up on TV. So that's a great example and so I can make so my first episode my first four episodes I edited out every uh every cough every time I said something that I thought sounded stupid one it took me four or five hours every week to do two I realized I listened back to some of these things and they sound kind of artificial I can hear the cuts and so the last packy episode was the first episode where I just really didn't cut anything um and it was very liberating one it saved me a ton of time two it's not like I got all these texts being like, wow, you say the word like a lot. People will probably think of this now because it's a problem with me. I say the word like a lot. I was like, screw it. Uh, a, this is not sustainable. B, this is not authentically me. It's not authentically the show. And if I'm going to keep on doing this, I need to lean in. So that was a big, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because for me, when I started doing the podcast, I wanted it to be perfect. As someone who's watched and listened to both the Packy episode and previous episodes of your podcast, 
I did not notice the difference between yeah. the two, which is so fascinating because sometimes we're so in our head about how our product seems, but the truth is the audience doesn't notice to that level of detail that you do about yourself. Well, the worst thing I ever did was I use like a trans. You, you probably do it too, maybe, maybe you don't, where I transcribe it to see what to edit. So I put all my, my talking points into words and I once did control F like, and you, it looked like a Christmas tree. And I was just like, holy shit. <laughs> and I remember being like, oh my God, it's all, I can't even put this episode out. And it gets in your head when you see it written and you're so in it that you don't take a step back and realize no one is that in it. They want to turn their brain off and listen. And the uhs, the likes don't turn anyone off and it, it makes the conversation feel more natural. And that's why they're tuning into a podcast. Yeah, and I saw a study from Rob Henderson, actually, he reposted it. It was a great follow, Rob Henderson on Twitter. He said that people who use um are actually more trustworthy. And that is mind blowing because you think if you're speaking, you shouldn't use um, you shouldn't use like, you shouldn't make mistakes. Right. But when someone says um, it indicates they're thinking and the listener then appreciates that they're thinking more and trust them more as a result, which is just right. an interesting way to, to think. But going back to something you've said, you said, I'd rather consistently get 50,000 YouTube views than 2 million Instagram followers. Why'd you make that statement and, and unpack it a little bit for us here? These are all my Twitter hot takes. Um, I'm just a big believer. I wonder what context I put that in, but I don't really care. It doesn't really matter. I think the word community is what I come back to and Long form content is so, so hard. It is not, but it's a, it's a true relationship with your audience, whether it's a podcast or a YouTube video. The reason I, those are my favorite assets to sponsor is you're tapping into that relationship. You can tell a brand story, you can connect with the audience and there's a level of trust there. And when you do influencer marketing, you want that trust. You want them to say, all right, if Danny recommends it, then he must mean it and I should, I'll remember it. And so that's why I love long form content, I think. And YouTube views are so hard to come by that I, I, I really put a lot of value on that. On Instagram, I'm not discounting Instagram and saying every Instagram creator is worthless. But what I am saying is it's, it's really hard to build that same connection. And it, that's why you see a lot of top Instagrammers go or top TikTokers are now launching YouTube channels and now launching podcasts because they want that connection. It is something that's gonna follow them around wherever they go, and that's how they build that deeper, deeper connection. And if you think about this, I've been working on this tweet in my head, and I probably shouldn't try to explain it out loud, but like there's an attention funnel here, right? Where Twitter, TikTok, Instagram are at the top of it. It's maybe, it's easier maybe to get most eyeballs on it, but your relationship with your audience isn't as tight. And so what you're seeing is somebody like take, um, I don't know, take Charlie D'Amelio. She's gonna go from TikTok, she now has a YouTube channel, so she's going down that attention funnel more. That's a harder, harder audience to build, but the per value of that audience is stronger. And she's gonna keep on going down the funnel to the point where she's gonna have live shows, for sure. She's gonna be going to do, she's gonna do a membership site, for sure, maybe some Patreon type thing like Cody's doing. But there's this funnel that you're constantly trying to move your audience down so you have more control and a truer, more real connection to your audience. And Instagram is the top of that funnel. And I'm looking for creators who can push to long form content. Because if you're willing to hear someone talk, you actually give a shit. That's, and that's, that means a lot. That's a bar right there. And that explains why I started the podcast to begin with. I was doing these tweets and I was like, I want a deeper connection with people. I want right. to, them to really understand me as a human being. And so, that's where the podcast came to be. And on that idea, you know, you mentioned Twitter, Instagram um, as the top of the funnel, TikTok as the top of the funnel. Where do you see the top of the funnel being in 2025? If you had to fast forward, where are the platforms that people are going for attention to start with? It's a tough one. Um, I mean, right now it's TikTok. So we'll start there. Right now it's TikTok. I don't understand TikTok. We're, we're about to start sponsoring it and try to figure it out. I don't think anyone's quite figured it out, but I posted a video on TikTok. I have more views on my TikTok 
on one video of my TikTok has a million views, it's more views than I'm gonna get on my YouTube channel in a year. And I just posted, I had no audience, zero. I remember I posted it, I was talking to my wife, she was like, why are you on your phone? I said, I have to post this TikTok video. She says, no one follows you on TikTok. I said, you're right, post the video. We watch, you know, some show. I think we were finishing like Friends. Go to bed, wake up the next morning, and it has 500,000 views. And I was just like, what is going on here? And so it's great about TikTok because it finds your audience. And I heard about it on a recent Colin Samir episode that I thought was an interesting way of thinking about it where there's not enough supply in a couple different platforms that you can really meet right now. So there's so much you go through so many TikTok videos, there actually isn't enough supply out there for the, the audience and you can really pop. YouTube is pretty saturated. If you're trying to do YouTube, it's really, really hard. Um, people say Facebook is a massive opportunity right now. I haven't done it, um, but apparently it's, it's, it's big. And then YouTube Shorts is kind of a growth hack that I'm like trying to dabble with. In terms of the future though, it probably hasn't been invented yet, right? Like, I don't know, I, I, TikTok came out of nowhere. And now you look at the people who are dominating social media right now, they're TikTok stars. Um, so I don't know. I, I think it hasn't been invented yet. But at the top of the funnel, it's just, it's just it, TikTok really just changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Yeah. And as a creator on TikTok specifically, let's say, how do you create on the platform without getting taken advantage of the algorithm and find yourself 10 hours on TikTok? or it could be YouTube in general. How does a creator look at the landscape and all the amazing things that people are creating and not get sucked into it themselves? It's a great question. I don't know, be really busy. I mean, I think <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, I, 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 I've interviewed Josh Richards, who's someone I've gotten kind of close to. I think he's done a great job of, he views TikTok as just a stepping stone to other things. He, if I called him a TikTok star, he would be not insulted, but he thinks himself as more than that. So he's moving from TikTok to YouTube. He does the show with Dave Portnoy on YouTube. He moved into investing. He just raised a fund. He's doing other things where TikTok is just one part of it and it's not his entire life. And kind of flipping your question, what's scarier for me is if you're a creator who's just only building on TikTok, that is a platform more than any other platform maybe other than Instagram, where the algorithm, no, it's bigger, where the algorithm dictates everything. And that is a scary position for a creator to be. And I think the moment when people thought TikTok was going away, all these creators who had built this audience on TikTok said, all right, I need to wake up. I need to build my YouTube. I need to build a podcast. I need to do get into business. And that was a true wake up call to a lot of them. And I'm glad it happened because even though TikTok didn't go away, you see a lot of these creators now have shifted their audience elsewhere. They've diversified to a point where they're not just beholden to TikTok and this algorithm. What's the point when a creator who's just getting started, maybe in year one, two, three, should think about diversifying? I, I mean, for me personally, and again, I'm not a big creator, but I hit 40,000 followers on Twitter. I felt like I was getting really good responses. I kind of felt like I I kind of, I'd started to hit the, call it the total addressable market of influencer thought leader Twitter. I felt <laughs> like I'd reached there. I can expand and do more marketing related stuff, which I'm, I'm, I need more time, but I could do. So for me, it was more of a all right, I want to go deeper. Just like you, I, I, I had this, I wanted it in my soul to try to take this and build a real community on podcasts. So I wouldn't force it, but I feel like it's once you feel like you've maxed out the new thing and you're looking for a challenge was kind of how it was for me. And I think for other creators, it's maybe they want to, they're inspired to do it, but you should probably lead with, I'm inspired to do it because it's really hard to do YouTube if you don't want to do it. It's really hard to do a podcast if you don't want to do it just because you feel like you should do it because it's not always fun. I mean, you figured it, you figured out a routine, but for me, it's, it's a, so a really big grind for me. And so if I w didn't really actually want to do this and take my audience here, if I just felt like I ought to do it, I probably would quit. What are some of the things that help you keep going? Um, feeling like I'm getting better. Like, like the episodes, I'm like, all right, I'm getting better. I'm enjoying this. I was really proud of the Packy episode for me. That was one where I felt like I was myself. I got 
good shit from the guests. I didn't have to edit it. And I, I was just proud of myself. I think like that was one. So that's kind of it. Try not to get too obsessed with the numbers. Cause I don't know about you, but when you're starting out, you build up this idea in your head. I was like, I, I, my wife makes fun. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll be a top. Bit. Like who the fuck did I think I was trying to be like, I'm going to walk in a podcast and be this big swinging dick and I'm going to get a top podcast. It's hard as hell. So it's humbling at first. And you go through this humbling to, okay, now I actually want to focus on the content. My ego is aside. How do I get better at this? And then I just try to book guests so that I have the pressure on myself to keep on going. If I don't want to tell someone, hey, I'm not recording today because I quit my podcast. Like that sucks. So keep <laughs> on. And my goal, you're at episode what? You've like done how many? What episode are you on? This is episode 111. 111. So my goal, I was like, I need to make it to episode three. And I just think now it's, it was seven. Now my goal is like 20 something and just trying, cause I know it's going to get easier. I know it's going to get more fun. I know it's going to get more natural. I know I'll get good at it. So I don't know <laughs> that those are kind of <laughs> like my, the way I'm thinking about it right now, but I don't know. I'm motivated to do it. And when an episode comes out and you feel like people enjoyed it and you get some texts about it, like that's a pretty cool feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Especially as a, podcast which is longer form which is someone's real connection with what you're talking about as opposed to just a tweet where someone's like oh that's pretty cool yeah the tweets are it's tweets are so i love it and i hate it because there's a lot of growth hacks on twitter that's really easy easy is the wrong word but once you hit a certain level on twitter you can do some stuff to really grow really really fast and it's just like short-term serotonin serotonin boost but a lot of it i don't know to me it's just like it's just so superficial. Like to be good at business, you need to work hard. It's like, yeah, no shit. You need to work hard. But at a certain level of Twitter, those tweets work. And I just like, I'm trying to not be that person. And so that's like kind of where Twitter can take you. If you keep on wanting to grow your audience, like massively on Twitter, it can sometimes take you away from producing substance because you want the biggest possible aperture on your content, the most people to find it relevant. But if you've gone that wide, you're almost like not even I don't know. I don't want to be a hater, but you almost don't even, you're not even tweeting substance. And so that's kind of like the rub for me on, on Twitter. If I felt like I kept on trying to do, you know, that stuff, like I did it for a while and I was like, I'm just tweeting pithy nonsense. So it didn't feel like your actual no. heart and soul putting it into, you felt like you were hacking a formula of I some like sort. I was hacking a formula. It's like, all right, you know, yeah, it was just, I'm trying to remember one that like stuck out to me, but just, you know, the most important rules of business. And it's like focus, like you could formulate these tweets once people think that you're, once you've reached a certain audience size that would get great engagement, but you're not actually saying anything. And so to me, I, when I like doing Twitter, this is like, or I like doing stuff is when I'm providing like real substance. So I try to make my tweets to be like, all right, for instance, someone came out with this insane graph that all these marketers are just dumping money into Facebook. And I'm like, what are you doing? First of all, that's my hot take, but this is how I am doing my, this is how I am spending my money. So if there's other marketers out there, they can shit on me, they can not shit on me, but at least I'm providing value and I'm putting, you know, 70% of my money on YouTube, 25% of my money on TikTok and 5% on Instagram stories to amplify my YouTube videos. But that's my spend breakdown going into this year. So how do you come up with that breakdown specifically? <laughs> I don't know. I uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's not rocket science for me. It's like I, this this isn't counting podcasts. So take podcasts out of it. This wasn't a podcast thing. It was all right. We love YouTube. If I that's my core. That's where I'm generating the most business for the company. So in a in theoretically, if I'm like a finance, if, if I have a portfolio, those are my big like large cap growth stocks. I need to do that. But if I'm going to take advantage of the future. I need to invest in, in these smaller companies, which in my case is TikTokers, who I haven't quite figured out yet, but I need to unlock that because if you look at the transition, for me, it's been podcasts, YouTube, and then there's an empty blank on what's next. And for me, I think TikTok could be that, but I don't know how to approach it yet. And so I need to dedicate enough budget and I don't think it's gonna work at first to figure out what that works. So that's, I just said 20% makes sense to me. And then, um, the 5% is kind of Instagram stories can be really good for 
a specific moment in time. For instance, one of my regrets, um, I thought about it the next morning, I'm like, why the fuck didn't I think of that? But exactly when the schedule got released, why didn't I have every single NFL person at 8 p.m. when the NFL drops a schedule doing an Instagram story saying, buy your tickets here? Easy, it's ephemeral, it's a moment to capitalize on. And that's when I would use that kind of thing. Or let's say Harry Styles goes on sale. Goes on sale. There's two times people buy tickets on the on sale and two weeks, roughly two weeks before the show's in their town. If you can capitalize, but that first moment applies to everyone. Everyone can buy a ticket in that moment. So why don't I partner with every single Harry Styles Instagram fan account? And that's where I would use those Instagram stories. So, but that's not a big part of my budget. That's like a, I'm gonna flex it when I see the moment. So I try to look at it. Maybe it's just me giving myself more sophistication than it needs as a kind of like a financial advisor where I have a portfolio of what I'm gonna add, what I'm gonna subtract. And it's gonna, the core is gonna be YouTube, but I think and I need to test the growth is gonna be TikTok, or maybe it won't be, but I need to know because I can't be the the last brand to move. I always have to be the first mover. I love how you think about this, like investing in a stock portfolio or, or a venture capitalist would. I think it's a very interesting way to look at what's going on with creators in general. And I really appreciate you bringing that but level I'm not of insight. A financial advisor. And, <laughs> None and, of this is investment advice. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I do not view my influence the much I work with the stocks. But yes, it's a very helpful <laughs> mindset because otherwise, I don't know. You can start to romanticize it a little bit too much. Um, and business ultimately, like you have to look at things that are driving your business. And if you, well, the brand effect of this, I get that, but it's also you need to have a, a very regimented approach to how you look at things. I love it, man. Any final pieces of parting advice for the people who are, are listening? Let's say a creator who's just getting started. What, what would you tell that person on day one? Um, don't think about getting brand deals because you want to build yourself there. I think for me, I think I, I, I did an episode with Joe Pompliano who has blown up in the sports media space. And for him, I asked him the same question. And what he told me, and I thought it was a really great response was, you know, just do it. And it sounds so cliche to do, but I talked about doing this podcast for two years. I talked about it and it, you build it up in your mind to the point where you might never actually do it because you're like, Hey, this has to be right. I need the logo to be sick. I need all this stuff. Ultimately, you start to figure that stuff out. You get better. You're going to do it. For Joe, Joe opened his, he started his Substack like three years ago and never posted. He created the account two years ago, never posted. And for him, he had built it up in so much mind that he didn't actually move forward. And finally, he said, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go for it. And if I'm a new creator, it's really easy to build up those barriers. For me, it was like, I got to have exactly the right camera, exactly the right sound, exactly the right lights, exactly the right guests. And at a certain point, you just need to put yourself out there and do it. And so that what I would recommend to creators. And don't be disappointed if you're not, if you have these insane expectations for yourself that you should be a top like 10 business podcast. Like I, I'm embarrassed that I thought that, but like, it's also a great like, I probably wouldn't have done it if I didn't think I could do it, but then I know it's how hard it is to get there. So I don't know, just just do it, man. It's um, That's what I recommend to any creator out there. And I don't know, and like credit to you because it's not easy to put yourself out there. Thank you, man. And thank you for the incredible advice. Where can people find more from you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Ian R. Borthwick, Ian Borthwick on Twitter. I tweet. I don't know, creator related stuff, anything in the creator space is something I really focus on. And then we talked about it here. I would love it if you subscribe to the business side, the business side by Ian Borthwick. You can find it on all your, your things. And if you give me a five star review, that would be even cooler. And it's a great podcast. Everyone who enjoyed this one will definitely enjoy that. Um, and we'll link all those in the show notes. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate Thanks, you. Thanks, man.